How do you like that music? <laughs> it's pretty good. It's like a toe tapper, isn't it? Yeah. Good. Well, hey, I'm looking forward to being with you here on this campus independent weekend. And I'm really excited to share with you a message that actually has been assigned to the campus pastors uh, for this weekend on our vision here at Woman to love well. And if you have any part of Woodman, you know, I mean, you can't get around that, right? It's everywhere. And even if you're out in the atrium, you see the big display out there to love well. And it's a big deal around here. In fact, I was thinking about it. I thought, wow, that's pretty, uh, pretty neat that Josh is entrusting that to the campus pastors. And then I thought, well, I better not mess it up. So I know the other campus pastors, they'll be fine. Uh, but I think we should take some time here to pray and uh, ask the Lord to help us uh, through this time together. So let's just pray together. Lord, we are grateful that we get to come together to worship, to learn from your word. And Lord, I just, I need you. I need your spirit. I need you to work through this. And uh, I just pray you just open our hearts. Lord, whatever it is that you'd have to say to each and every single one of us, I know you speak differently to each of us here today. And so uh, we just look forward to what you're going to do. Uh, I pray that we would learn more about you, about your love. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, love is a word that we see all over the place in our culture, isn't it? I mean, the question that we're asking today is, are we loving well? Now, the Beatles, they sang, all you need is love. And there are times in our lives that that's what we need to experience, right? We need to hang out with the extravagant grace and love of God, right? But then we have other musicians in our culture, like Tina Turner, who asked the question, what has love got to do with it? She says, it's just a secondhand emotion. It's a pretty low view of love, isn't it? But to be absolutely, absolutely honest and, and truthful with you, I found that love is probably one of the, the hardest things to live out. I think it's the hardest thing to practice. And it's not that it's so complicated. I think we, we make it complica complicated, actually. When things are hard, or you know, we, we tend to just overcomplicate them. It gets us off the hook. We think, you know, that's just above my pay grade. I mean, so, so complicated. I mean, I know I'm supposed to love, but, you know, it's too complicated. But actually, it's very simple. It's just hard to do. So how are we doing at loving well? It's the question that God asks us right from the very beginning of the Bible. It's also one of the last questions he asks us before we enter eternity. And so it's like two book, bookends with the same question and we spend our entire lives con continually working to figure out how we can love better. And God says, in the end, what I'm after is people who know how to love well. So one of the questions that we need to ask today is what does it look like for those of us who are followers of Jesus? What's it look like for us, those of us who come together as followers of Jesus in this place we call the church, what's it look like for us to love well? Well, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul tells us what Jesus' followers are supposed to look like. And we're going to be looking at Colossians 3, and you don't need to turn there yet, because I want to give you some context. I want to give you a little background that I think will inform us in our main text in Colossians 3 here today. The Apostle Paul, he came into the world, he was known as Saul of Tarsus. And as he began to flesh out the teaching of, teachings of te Jesus, he would take what Jesus taught and he would make them even more practical. I mean, these were Gentile Christians, just like us, they didn't have a, a Jewish background. And so he would try to drill it down a little bit. And the primary teaching of Jesus that the Apostle Paul, he leveraged over and over again, was something that Jesus said at the very end of his life, at the very time whenever he was ready to leave this earth. And it was the night that actually Jesus was going to be arrested. He gathered his 12 disciples together. One of them leaves and no one really knows why. And he says, guys, something new is about to happen. And here's what Jesus said. A new command I give you. You've heard this before, I bet. A new command I give you, and here it is. Love one another. John 15. Now, because we're English, because we're modern, we totally miss the emotion. It just rippled through the room whenever Jesus said these words. Let me just give you a hint. Who had the authority to give the Jewish people a new command? God. Only God. It's like, who do you think you are, Jesus? 
Jesus thinking, just hang in there for a few days. You'll find out. Resurrection, right? And to which we even say to Jesus' words, you know, that's not new. I mean, I've heard this my whole life. And Jesus would say, yeah, I know you've heard it your whole life, but I'm not finished yet. A new command I give you to love one another. And then he ups the bar. As I have loved you, you must love one another. He says, if you forget everything else I say, these are my last and final words. But he says, you're not supposed to love one another the way you love one another. You're supposed to love one another the way I love one another. He said, you're supposed to take your cues from me, not from each other. So Jesus, he says to Matthew, the disciple, the follower of Jesus, he says, you remember how I loved you? I mean, you were a traitor to your nation. You are a traitor to your family. You had no friends. You were just friends with tax gatherers, with with publicans and sinners. Remember that day I walked up to you and you're collecting taxes. And I mean, Peter, he just wanted to spit on you. I mean, he was all amped up. And before Peter could even spit on you, I said, Matthew, before you change anything you believe about me, before you're, before you're even sure what I'm about, Matthew, I love you. Would you come and join me? Would you join my posse? Remember that day, Matthew? Remember how you felt loved that day? I want you to take that feeling of love. I want you to take that to your brothers here, to your other disciples. Jesus was saying to Nathaniel, do you remember what you said about me? Do you remember the very first thing that came out of your mouth about me? Do you remember that? And Nathaniel would be kind of like, yeah. And he'd say, Yo, here's what it is, Nathaniel. He said, I remember specifically what you said. In fact, John recorded it. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, you dissed my whole family. You dissed my town, my relatives. You remember that, Nathaniel? Yeah. You remember how I responded to you? I said, Nathaniel, join me. Experience my love. Come be a part of this community. I included you anyway. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another, guys. One another. And these guys, they had not even experienced Jesus' love at that point in their point in time with with Jesus. And then Jesus says to his disciples, he says, hey guys, you remember that time that I preached about eating my flesh and drinking my blood? And everybody just freaked out and and like, you're ready to go. Like, we're done. And they're all looking around the room and saying, yeah, we remember that. You remember how I responded to you when you were ready to abandon me? Remember, I chose to, to stay with you. I didn't abandon you. And they're like, yeah, we remember that. He says, okay, when I say I want you to love as I have loved you, that's the kind of love I'm talking about. And then he said this, and this is the part that drove what the Apostle Paul taught and communicated. As he went around Europe, as he planted and started churches for the next years, this is the thing that drove the Apostle Paul. By this, by this love, everyone will know that you're my disciples. They'll know you're my disciple. A disciple means follow. That's where we get the word. He said, it is by this kind of unusual love that everyone will know that you're my disciples, my followers, if you love one another. In other words, this is the mark. This is what people are going to see. Jesus says, this is how I want people to distinguish you. This is the thing I want people to look at, to see, to experience, to say, yeah, see that, see that woman over there? She's a Jesus follower. See that guy over there? We know he's a Jesus follower. This is huge. I mean, this is the only time that Jesus says, this is the thing that I want to mark you as a follower. It's the only time. And Jesus says, this is my new commandment. You see, this is the first time that your devotion to God is not measured by your vertical love for God. I mean, there's too many loopholes to get around that. Now... It's measured by your love of other people. That's the new commandment. It was radical. No longer old covenant vertical relationship as God is the only focus. But now our devotion is judged by that horizontal love of the people in our lives. And it comes down to how we treat each other. If you mistreat someone for whom Jesus died, you can't be okay with Jesus. It's a new day. It's a new commandment. It's a new covenant. And our devotion to God is demonstrated by our love 
for others. And so Simon Peter, he immediately responds to Jesus' last words here. And Simon asks him, he says, Jesus, where are you going? Jesus is like, what? He's like, you know, just like 10 minutes ago, you were talking about going somewhere. Like, where, where are you going? Jesus is thinking, okay, I just gave you like my last and final words. The thing I want you to get here. And you're asking me where I'm going? This is your response? And it's kind of like us. We say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Love one another? Yeah, I got that. You know, I mean, yeah, we need to, to love our, one another. But, but Andrew, you know, my wife, she's got these issues. And she's, she has this thing that bugs me. And I know we're supposed to love each other, but, but what? Or, you know, there's this guy at work and I just can't stand him. I know I'm supposed to love this guy. But can I get a job at your church? It's like, really? I mean, this whole love of one, one another thing, we've, we've heard it so many times, haven't we? And I wonder if we really think about it the way we need to. And Jesus says, look, this isn't just a throwaway. This isn't just a religious line. This isn't just a, a good phrase that we sing here in a worship song. I'm telling you, I want this love one another to mark you. But here's the problem, and it's in all religions, including Christianity, and you name it. And I'll just pick on us since we're all in the room together here. But in all religions, the gravitational pull is away from treating people well and toward ritual or role keeping rather than relationship building. And the reason is that I'm in control when it's about role keeping. And I'd rather God love me because I did this thing and I didn't do this thing. And whenever I did do this thing, and I asked him for forgiveness and now I'm good with God and I apologize to him and now I'm, you know, I'm right with him. And so things can be right between me and God and we're cool, but I can hate you. And it's okay for me to, to not have to engage with you as long as I love God. And Jesus is saying, you know what, I want to make sure that what I'm about, it doesn't go there. The gravitational pull of religions is to move toward rule keeping and rituals and traditions. And traditions can be good, but not in the place of treating people well. And we've all seen it go bad, haven't we? I mean, in fact, some of you, this is your story. <laughs> some of you have been mistreated in the name of religion. Some of you have been mistreated in the name of Jesus. Somebody said to you, you know, you can't or, you know, we don't want you because, or the church teaches this. And, and so in essence, they rejected you in the name of Jesus who died for you. And in fact, it might be why you haven't been to church for a while. For some of you, it's why you don't read the Bible. The person who you know, who knows the Bible the best is the meanest person you know. It's because religion focuses on role keeping over relationship. Because it's just so much easier to check the list, to check the boxes, rather than to love people who are hard to love. And Jesus says, this is the thing I want to be different about you. So when we come to our text in Colossians today, it's been about 20 years that have gone by since Jesus says these words in John 15. It's not 120 years like some of you might have learned in your college freshman English class where they said there was this oral tradition, everything got changed and mixed up and all that, that's... That's not true. It's actually about 22 years later after Jesus. And the Apostle Paul now, he is a Christian, which is a miraculous story in and of itself. I mean, that's a whole other message. And he's going all around the Mediterranean Rim. And he's walking in the synagogues and he's telling people that God has done something unusual in Jerusalem. And Jesus, the Messiah, has come. And the Jewish people in the synagogue, they just pick him right up and they throw him out. And so on one occasion, nine people snuck out that night. And they said, Paul, we want to hear more about that. And Paul began the start of planting churches all around Europe. And he would take this mix of Jewish and Gentile people and he would start churches. And in many, many of his letters, he would say, all right, now we need to go back to the basics. And instead of just saying, you know, we, want, we need to love one another, oftentimes he would get real explicit and he would say very specific things about how we can love one another's. I mean, he does, it's not that he doesn't say love one another. He does say that in his epistles. But he uses words with adjectives. And that's what we're going to look at here this morning. 
He said he talked about the kinds of things that should characterize us as Jesus followers in terms of how we can love. So the book of Colossians, it's a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. It's about 100 miles from Ephesus. It used to be a thriving center. It's not anymore. And it's just really important that we have this background as we jump into the text in Colossians 3. So now, Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Are you ready? Okay. Put on then, some translations say here, clothe yourselves. This is not talking about Christian t-shirts. As God's chosen ones, writing to Christians, holy and beloved. (coughs) Then Paul gives us a bunch of these specific virtues that we're going to work through together, that we are supposed to put on, mentally and emotionally, we're to put these things on. Now let me just pause right here. I might, I would encourage you, just if, just down the road, you might want to write down some of, some of these virtues. I'm going to put some definitions up here on the screen. And it might be something you want to come back to uh, at a later time. So just to give you a little heads up on that, you can put it in your phone, text it to yourself, however you want to do that. But we're going to work through this list of virtues here together and give you some definition to that. So verse 12, first vir- virtue. Paul says, put on or clothe yourself with compassionate hearts. In the Greek text there, there's usually two different words that are translated from into this word compassion. Now, you know the phrase in our English that says, uh, we love someone with our heart. You know, I just love you with all my heart. And Greek culture, they, they didn't say they loved with all their heart. They literally said, and this is, this is actually a little gross, they loved with all their bowels or your guts. So you love with all your bowels. I mean, that means, you know, we're talking about, we're, we're feeling, we're taking on this feeling. We feel bad. Every single one of us, we've experienced this before with people, right? When our heart breaks, we feel compassion. We don't feel in our chest. We feel in our gut, right? Parents, I mean, you could, you could try this whenever you go home with your kids. Sweetheart, I love you with all my bowels. <laughs> See how that works. Maybe, maybe not. So this is the idea. I want you to put on, he uses the analogy of clothing yourself with a sense of compassion. And here's why this is important. This is different than, you know, you should have studied harder. I mean, it's okay to say you should have studied harder, but that's not how you lead out. That's initially not where we want to go. Or, or we don't say, you know, you should have worked harder. And that may be true, but that's not where we want to start. We want to be known as a group and as individual people who are compassionate, that we feel bad for them and their situation. We feel bad for what they're going through, that we feel what they're experiencing, regardless of the fact that they got it wrong, regardless of the fact that they messed up, regardless of the fact that they could have maybe kept it from happening, regardless of the fact that they didn't listen to you the first three times. It's that compassionate heart. And you know, we can all make excuses in terms of why we don't extend that compassion. And Paul says, I'm telling you, I want you to wear this. I want you to put this on every day. I want you to be known as having a compassionate heart. And I know for some of us, and I can relate to this, we can excuse ourselves because of our personality. Like, yeah, I'm just not that guy. I've been there. There's no excuse. Then he goes on and he adds another word, kindness. Do you know what kindness is? This could be helpful. Kindness is when you loan your strength to someone else. You loan your strength to someone else. It's when something that needs to be done, you need to do it for them. You bless them. You extend yourself. You loan your strength. And he says, I want you to just put on this new habit, this new approach to life, and you loan and you give people what they need. You give them, you give them your strength. I mean, someone's kind to you, and you say, you know, why are you kind to me? Well, it's because they did something unusual for you. I mean, they didn't have to do it. They didn't owe it to you. They loaned or gave you their strength. They loaned you their capacity. So Paul says, I want you to put on compassion. I want you to put on kindness. And then he says, I want you to put on humility. Again, everyone sort of knows what humility is, right? Remember, these things are all in relationship to other people. So humility in relationship to other people, it's very simple. Humility is seeing myself as I really am in relationship to other people and to God. It's viewing myself accurately. 
An accurate view is that I'm nothing more than a citizen of humanity, like the rest of you. The fact that I might be able to jump higher, make more money, have a special ability or talent, some particular area, whatever it does, whatever it is, it doesn't change the fact that we are all born naked into this world. We don't have any control of who we were born to. It doesn't change the reality that none of us has any control as to when we're going to die. God is the one who makes us special. And what makes us special is the fact that God, as the God of the universe, he unconditionally loves us. We are all peers in this world of having this God, the canopy of God's love over all of us. And he says, I want you to exude that kind of humility. Well, Paul goes on here he's to the next word in the English Standard Version, which is what we use here at Woman, and it says meekness. I like some of the other translations because I relate to the word gentleness a little better. What is gentleness? Gentleness is the decision to respond to you in light of your strengths and weaknesses instead of responding to you out of my strength. Gentleness is designed to come to your level of strength or weakness as opposed to coming to you with my strength. It's the difference of picking up a contact lens or picking up a baseball in the palm of my hand, and I have the capacity to do both, but I'm going to adjust my approach to each one and adjust my strength according to the object of my strength. You know what that means? It means gentle people don't come into the conversation and don't maintain their relationships from a position of who they are and what they've accomplished and what they've done and what their knowledge and insight and background and all that. They gear down to the level of the person. It's not condescending. It has nothing to do with, with being condescending, but it has everything to do with, con with communicating this. Are you ready? My relationship with you is more important than you being impressed with me. My relationship with you is more important than you knowing how powerful I am. My relationship with you is more important than you knowing my capacity, my strength. And I'm going to adjust for your benefit. That's gentleness. Next... Paul says patience. We all know what patience is, don't we? Patience is a decision, isn't it? It's basically deciding to go the speed of another person. That's all it is. Patience gearing down, it's gearing back, it's determining, you know what? I'm going to move at your speed instead of mine. So Paul, he gives us all these virtues. And he says, I want you to put on these Virtues. I want you to close yourself daily, every morning, because this is how I want you to be known. This is what Jesus is saying when he says love one another, how we can love. And then he summarizes in verse chapter 13 with a couple big thoughts. He says, bear with each other, which is the same as bear with one another. It's another one of those one another's. Bear with each other and forgive one another. So if anyone has a grievance against someone, he, he strings it right back to what Jesus had been talking about throughout his ministry. Is he saying, you know, well, forgive as others have forgiven you? No. He's saying forgive as Jesus, as the Lord forgave you. It's a pretty tall order. In all of this, he's saying, I, I want you to be loving. I want you to be compassionate. I want you to be kind just as God and the Lord Jesus have been compassionate with you. I want you to be gentle like God has been gentle with you and patient with you. I mean, do you remember how many times you said, okay, God, I'm not going to do that anymore. Can you do it again? I mean, can you even count how many times God has been patient with you? He says, I want you to extend these virtues to all the people that are in your life and in your world. And then he summarizes this way. And over, overall, all these things, he's talking about these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I mean, this is a fancy way of saying basically love is the umbrella. It's the overarching idea. 
This is the canopy in which all these things hang. Love is the summary idea here. And he just lists it out, what love means and how we need to put these on every day. Now let me just be transparent with you. As I've been working through this message and thinking about these virtues, I thought, wow, you know, that's a lot of stuff. I mean, honestly, it's felt a little overwhelming. Like how, how can I live these out? How can I keep these on my radar every single day and pull this off? And, and my guess is you're probably thinking some of the same thoughts. And you're probably thinking, you know, Andrew, this message is exactly what I would expect a preacher to say. I'd expect to come to church and hear this message on compassion, you know, and kindness. And, you know, and, you know, when you whisper, it's more spiritual. It's kind of how that works. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, we, we're going to hold hands and we're going to put on our Sunday school pins and we're going to sing Kumbaya and we're going to just, you know, try to pursue this. But that's not, that's not how it works, is it? You see, the thing that allows me to lean into this and to really take this seriously is because of who said it. When I think about the Apostle Paul and who that guy was. I mean, this is a guy that accomplished more in a few years than any of us will ever accomplish in a lifetime. I hate to tell you that no one's probably going to know your name in 2,000 years. No one's going to quote you. Probably you're not going to start a new movement that's going to last for ages. I mean, you might have a really cool company. You might even have the greatest app in the world. But I can tell you, nobody's going to be talking about that in about 100 years. And I think if you're the Apostle Paul, he would say, yeah, I understand your angst. I mean, yeah, my personality, like type A, activator, get it done, take no for an answer, putting on love every day, putting on these virtues every day. Yeah, it's a challenge. But when I see that this is who he was and what he did, it makes me think this is possible. I can do this. I can put on gentleness and humility and kindness. But he says, you know, Jesus wants to identify with you as his followers, not because of what you do, not because you show up here Sunday morning at 11, between 11 and 12. He says, Jesus wants people to identify with you as his followers because of how you treat people and how you exemplify these virtues in your life 24-7 outside of these walls. But it's a journey, it's a process for all of us, isn't it? And my dad used to say, you know, I don't always get it right, but I can make it right. And that's part of our growth, isn't it? That's part of our journey. But we got to keep these things in front of us. See, the problem with this sermon is that we go home from church and we're like, wow, okay. You know, it's a cool definition or whatever of that quality. But then we move on to the next sermon, the next weekend. And I just want to encourage you, if you have a quiet time in the morning, I, ho I hope you do, take Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Take some time with these virtues. Ask the Lord to say, you know, Spirit, how, how can I apply this in my relationships? Who do I need to be more patient with? You know, we all, if we're followers of Jesus and put our trust in him, we have the power of Christ, the Holy Spirit, to guide us in that. He can help us with that. But, you know, the other thing is that we can be tempted. And what we can do is, you know, as long as I have my quiet time and I focus on my vertical relationship with God, then I don't have to really worry about growing in these areas of loving better, serving more, whatever it might be, exhibiting these traits. You know, I got my relationship with God. I mean, why do I even need to love someone who doesn't know Jesus? And God says, you know, because I sent my son to die for you, I sent him to die for all people. And actually, you as a follower of Jesus, I, I want to use you to share my love with others. I mean, we can easily go to bed at night thinking, you know, we have a clear conscience because I'm good with God. I got peace with God. And yet we're not at peace with some people in our lives. And Jesus says, it doesn't work that way. To have peace with God, we need to pursue peace with the people we have in our lives. In fact, Paul, he says in Romans, he says, for as much as it's on us, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What if we got this right? Wouldn't we as the church 
just be so irresistible. You know, I think what makes <coughs> Christianity so resistible is that we, we don't love well. And Paul says, you just do for others what God in Christ has done for you. And it's that simple. If you have any questions how to love, I mean, if it's not good for them, you don't do it. I think it can be that simple. If it's not good for them, you don't do it. Christianity can be so compelling. It can be so life-changing if we take seriously this command to love one another. But I think it can also come down to this one clarifying question. What does love require of me? When in doubt, just ask yourself, hmm, what does love require of me? I mean, yeah, your wife's this or your husband's that or my prodigal son or daughter or this guy at work drives me crazy. But in that relationship, what does love require of me? And at the end of the day, you probably won't even need chapter and verse to help you with that because you have the Holy Spirit. You have the power of Christ. You know, the disciples in Matthew 25, they said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in and gave you clothes to clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? I mean, what are you, what are you talking about, Jesus? I mean, I thought, Lord, I'm having my quiet time. I'm connecting with you. I mean, what are you talking about that you were in need? I didn't see that. I don't get it. Do you remember what Jesus said? Do you remember how he responded? He said, you know, I'm glad you're having your devotional time. I'm glad you're going to church and you're praying and you're serving and you're, you're doing all that stuff. But I'm telling you, it's how you do it under the people in your life that determines what you do to me. He says, you are eyeball to eyeball with the people for whom I died and they are so precious to me. And you can't love me any more than you love the people in your life. All the people in your life. You know, in all of our studies of the Bible and theology, I mean, sometimes you come to some passages and it's just not clear. It's like, wow. I mean, really? Like, this is hard. But rarely is it not clear what's required of me. Rarely do I have to wonder. I think Jesus made it pretty clear. Well, final thought, and I'm done. You know, some of you know that I have three married kids and five grandchildren. And if you mistreat any one of my kids, their spouses, or any of my five grandchildren, do not invite me to lunch. <laughs> if you mistreat any of my family, don't try to be my friend. If you mistreat any of my kids or grandkids, there's no use sending me cards or notes of encouragement or really nothing. If you mistreat just one of my kids or grandkids, it won't make any difference if you sing praises to my name. I'm not impressed. If you want to make things right with me, you start with my kids, my grandkids. If you love my children, if you do something for them, if, if you're there when my children need something, you don't have to do anything for me. You're loving me when you love my kids. You know, I asked my wife, is there anything that brings you more satisfaction as a mom than watching our children love each other? And she said, other than being with you, that was supposed to be funny. But you believe me. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, she said, there's just nothing that brings her greater joy. And it's no mistake that whenever the disciples, they ask Jesus to teach them to pray, that he's, what do you start with? He started with our what? Our Father. And you can't be okay with the Father if you're mistreating one of the Father's kids. And you can't make your Heavenly Father any happier than if you love the children that the Father loves.
It's that simple. And it's the question, what does love require of me? By this, everyone will know, they'll know, that we are his disciples, his followers, if we love one another. And how we love all the people in our lives, whether they're in the flock or outside of it, Jesus died for all people, we will be known, we will be marked as followers of Jesus because we have loved all the people in our lives well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you <coughs> for preserving this letter to the Colossians. <coughs> when I think of the people who even lost their lives protecting these words, I'm just so grateful that we have these words to, to challenge and encourage our hearts. And Lord, I just know that this message lands with different people in different ways, and some of us are going to wrestle with it, others just might feel like the same old thing, and there might even be some who make some significant changes in their lives. But Lord, our desire is that your will would be done, not ours. And Lord, I just want to thank you for the, the people in Woodman Valley Chapel and this Woodman community, and especially here in this Heights community. Lord, the people who do get it. And Lord, I just see the generosity. I see people giving to this partners in the gospel. I see the people serving in the gifts of love and just all these projects and reaching out to our community and loving each other in community groups and, and all that. And Lord, we know you're working here. But Lord, we also know we need to continue to grow. That love is hard. So Lord, please help us to be known for our sacrificial forgiveness, for our sacrificial love for one another. Help us to, to teach and model for our children and our students and our college students how we can love well. Lord, we want to be marked as your followers. We want to be known in this community as, the, as those who love well. Lord, we need you. We ask for your help. In your name I pray. Amen.